Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another Victober video. Today I'm going to be talking about LGBTQ plus themes in Victorian literature. This is a video that I'm really excited to make and I've been thinking about making for quite a while. I have 11 Victorian books that I want to recommend to you today that are really really interesting in terms of looking at the presentation of sort of homoeroticism and sort of same-sex desire and same-sex relationships within Victorian literature. But before I get on to those recommendations I do want to quickly talk a little bit about the logistics and ethics I suppose of looking at like LGBT themes in Victorian literature and also talk about two non-fiction books that have been really influential on a lot of the stuff I will be talking about today. And just to say before I begin, obviously in the title of this video I've used the term LGBTQ+, but obviously LGBT or LGBTQ+, was not a term that existed in the Victorian period, nor was homosexual even a word that existed for the bulk of the Victorian period and didn't come into play until the 1860s, 1870s I think. So because of that, and because I think it's slightly dubious to use like anachronistic terms, the terms I will use for the bulk of this video will probably be homoeroticism or like same-sex desire or same-sex attraction. To begin with the two non-fiction books that have been quite influential on this video and which I think are worth a read if you're interested in the presentation of same-sex relationships in the Victorian literature and in the Victorian period as a whole. One is this book which is Same Sex Love 1700 to 1957 by Jill Rossini. This I read back in September and is a really interesting book. It is not a book about literature, it is a history book and it's a social history of same sex love as it says from 1700 to 1957 but it's really really interesting and was really informative in terms of this video in terms of being aware of the extent to which people in the Victorian period knew that people had same-sex relationships and the extent to which therefore it might be in their literature. And then another book which I will be referencing and using a lot today is a book that I read back when I was at university and is one of my favourite literary critical books I've ever read and that is Queer Dickens by Holly Fernu. I don't have a copy of it because it's an academic book and they tend to be quite expensive but I did notice that the price had recently gone down on Amazon so I have actually ordered myself a copy which I hopefully will have by the end of the month because I read it like three and a half years ago but I still think about it quite regularly whenever I read Dickens because it is one of the most fascinating critical books I've ever read. Basically Holly Fernie's book is using queer theory on Dickens and talking about the ways in which Dickens, who we might think of as an author who is a great advocate of domesticity, of nuclear families, of heteronormativity and um, heterosexuality is actually not that at all. And she brings up three particular things which I think you see not just in Dickens's work but in a lot of Victorian literature which I think are really interesting to look out for if you're interested in kind of homoeroticism and same-sex relationships within a Victorian literature. One thing I find really really interesting that Holly Fernu addresses in her books is the use of kind of surrogate families in Dickens and other Victorian literature which challenge heteronormativity. We often think of Dickens as a writer who is really heteronormative. Obviously like the bulk of his novels end with one or more more marriages between a man and a woman. But actually, as I've mentioned before on this channel, when you look at Dickens as a writer, when you look at the body of his work, there are very, very, very few happily married couples. And nuclear families with a mother, a father and children are very, very rare in Dickens. It's kind of only the Cratchits and maybe the Wilfers in Our Mutual Friend, but the Wilfers are all very unhappy and they're not exactly a nice presentation of a nuclear family. And actually for the bulk of Dickens' work, what you get instead of nuclear families made up of a mother, a father and children are surrogate families made up of surrogate parent figures and surrogate children figures and even within Dickens you do get surrogate families that are made of a child and their surrogate parent figures who are both of the same gender. For example Walter in Dombey and Son whose two main parent figures are Captain Cuttle and Solomon Gills both of whom are men. The second thing that Holly Fernie brings up in Queer Dickens which I find really really interesting and which I think you can spot in a lot of Victorian novels not just Dickens is a kind of transfer of affection whereby a young woman has a very 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 close female friend with whom she has a almost passionate sometimes romantic relationship with and she then falls in love with that best friend's brother. Similarly a young man very very closely attached to his best male friend falling in love with that best male friend's sister and you see this again and again in Victorian literature it's a really really common pattern and in a lot of these relationships as I'll talk about in a bit you can see it as this young man or young woman having romantic or sexual feelings for their friend of the same gender but in order to legitimize these feelings in a society that does not accept such feelings they therefore defer or transfer those feelings to the closest they can get to those people the closest they can get to a counterpart of that person in another gender their sibling of the opposite gender 
gender. This is incredibly common in Victorian literature and I'll talk about this a bit more later with a few specific examples. And then the third thing Holly Fernu talks about is that even if Dickens didn't intend to write some of his characters as being gay, there are some of his characters who when you read them it's really hard to view as otherwise. For example the character of Miss Wade in Little Dorrit. When Little Dorrit was adapted to screen back in 2007 or 2008 I think it must have been, Andrew Davis who wrote the screenplay said of Miss Wade, Dickens didn't write her as a lesbian but she just is. And I kind of agree and I think when you read Little Dorrit it's kind of hard not to agree with that. And even if Dickens didn't intend that, that doesn't mean that there isn't subtext there that isn't interesting to look at. Which leads me on I think to talking a little bit more generally about like what I'm gonna call the ethics of looking for homoeroticism and same-sex relationships within Victorian literature because obviously there are some Victorian authors who put homoeroticism and same-sex relationships or same-sex desire into their books on purpose. For example I think it's pretty fair to say that in the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde all of the homoeroticism in there was probably intentional. Similarly the relationship between Laura and Carmilla in J. Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla is so romanticised and so sexualised that I think it's absolutely impossible that that was not intended. However there are also a lot of incidences when reading Victorian literature where there are things which from a modern perspective seem very very homoerotic which at the time might not have one been perceived like that and also not been intended to be that. However there are three things I think it's quite important to remember when looking at homoeroticism and sort of LGBT plus themes in Victorian literature. One is that people did know that people had same-sex relationships. It was a thing that was known in the Victorian period. Not everybody knew of course and before the age of mass literacy less people knew but the more literacy there was people knew it was not uncommon in the Victorian period for men to be arrested, tried and sent to prison or hung for having sexual relationships with another man. There are several incidences in the Victorian period which were very scandalous and in lots of papers of female husbands where women were living as men in order to marry and live with another woman. This is something that Jill Rossini talks about in her book Same Sex Love quite a lot and addresses the fact that it's really hard to know from a modern perspective whether we should consider these female husbands as transgender men or as women women who wanted to live with other women and so therefore had to live as a man to do so and obviously we don't know. We but incidences like this made it into the papers quite often and people in the Victorian period would have known that people did have same-sex relationships even if it was considered completely taboo, even if it was illegal for men and considered a sin for women. It wasn't something that absolutely no one knew about it and therefore I don't think it's inconceivable to imagine that a lot of Victorian authors did put things like that into their books. Another thing that I think it's important to remember is that even for writers who didn't know about same sex relationships or didn't purposefully put them into their books, lots of people in the Victorian period did have them and therefore it is very possible that Victorian authors knew people who were in same sex relationships or who were gay or bisexual but it's very possible that Victorian authors who have homoeroticism within their books writing from relationships they had observed even if they didn't entirely recognise what they were observing. And the third thing I think it's important to remember is that, for me at least, as someone interested in looking at literature and as someone interested in the Victorian period, I don't think it matters whether the author intended to put homoeroticism or same-sex attraction in their books or not. If you can read it into it and if it's there, even if it's there much more from a modern perspective than it would have been at the time, it's still kind of there. I did some literary theory at university and I kind of always subscribed just a little bit to Roland Barthes theory of the author being dead which is basically that it kind of doesn't matter what the author intended, what matters more is what the reader gets from it and therefore even if some of the authors I'm going to be talking about didn't intend to portray same-sex relationships in their books it doesn't mean they didn't. So I think that's all I have to say on those issues. Now let's get on to the 11 books I want to talk about. So I'm going to start off with Dickens and there are four books by Dickens I want to talk about. The first is Dombey and Son which is one of my absolute favourites. As I recently spoke about in my video recommending great Victorian books to read by gender, Dombey and Son is really really interesting in terms of gender as, and is a fascinating book as a whole. But there's one particular relationship in here that really interests me and that is the relationship between Captain Cuttle and Solomon Gills who are kind of life partners and who both bring up Walter who is one of the heroes of Dombey and Son. They bring him up almost together. Solomon Gills is Walter's uncle and Captain Cuttle is Solomon Gills best friend. They almost bring up Walter together and Walter becomes their surrogate son as in a way at points in the book Florence becomes Captain Cuttle's surrogate daughter. I think the relationship between Solomon Gills and Captain Cuttle which is shown to be one of such trusting and close friendship and affection and also of one of real partnership I think is really really important and interesting to look at 
in terms of same-sex relationships, especially because they do create this kind of surrogate family. Walter is effectively brought up by two father figures. Another pair of men who greatly interest me are Phil Squad and Mr George in Bleak House. This is not my own thought, this came from Holly Furno's Queer Dickens, but I remember three years ago reading her book Queer Dickens and reading the bit where she talks about Mr George and Phil Squad and being like, yes! They are definitely in love. Those two men are definitely in love. It's just true. It's just one of those things you read in literary criticism and you're like, yes, actually, you are completely right about that. 100%. George and Phil Squad live together. They are a domestic unit and Phil is repeatedly described as George's familiar. George shows no interest whatsoever in women or matrimony and at one point he says that he is too much of a vagabond to get married. And he has another conversation at a different point in the book talking about how Phil and him will live a vagabond life together. They have a deeply close emotional emotional and physical relationship. Phil Squad is disabled, he was very severely injured in an accident years ago when he was working in a fireworks factory and the factory exploded and Mr George takes on a lot of his physical care. There's one scene in the book where Phil watches General George washing. It wakes Mr George at the shooting gallery and his familiar. They arise, roll up and stow away their mattresses. Mr George, having shaved himself before a looking glass of minute proportions, then marches out, bareheaded and bare-chested, to the pump in the little yard, and anon comes back shining with yellow soap friction drifting rain and exceedingly cold water as he rubs himself upon a large jack towel blowing like a military sort of diver just come up his crisp hair curling tighter and tighter on his sunburnt temples the more he rubs it so that he looks as if it never could be loosened by any less coincisive instrument than by an iron rake or a curry comb as he rubs and puffs and polishes and blows turning his head from side to side the more convenient to extronerize his throat and standing with his body well bent forward to keep the wet from his martial legs. Phil, on his knee, lighting a fire, looks round as if it were enough washing for him to see all that done, and sufficient renovation for one day to take in the superfluous health his master throws off. And in this paragraph we both get the sense of intimacy of Phil watching George wash, but also we get the sense of Phil getting his strength from watching that scene. And I do think that the partnership between these two men and the way they share their life and the way they look after each other does make them come across as a couple. Another thing I think it's worth noting is that Phil is a person with a disability, and I will talk about this a bit later as well, but there is an odd connection in Victorian literature between disability and same-sex desire, and I think this is probably a bit to do with a rather unpleasant Victorian trope of inward sin being shown on the outer form. Within Victorian literature, characters with disabilities often fall into one of two stereotypes, one being the victim and one being the villain. At some point in the future I might make a video about disability within Victorian literature because it's not very nice but it is very interesting. But in the meantime, if you're interested in the connection between disability and deformity and villainy within the media, I will link down below some videos that Jen Campbell has done on this. So part of the underlying ideology within the Victorian period of villains being people with deformities and disabilities comes from a Victorian idea that inward immorality might show itself or reveal itself on the outward form. The idea that if you have a beautiful face you must have a beautiful soul, and that if you have a face or figure which is considered by Victorian society to have something wrong with it then perhaps there is something wrong with your insight as well. One of the many unpleasant schools of thought you get in the Victorian period, but I think it's very interesting to look at how this idea interacts with ideas of same-sex desire within Victorian books, and I think it is quite telling that out of the 11 books that sprung to mind when I was trying to think of Victorian literature that has serious homoeroticism in it. Three of these books have characters with disabilities that are also presented as in some way exhibiting same-sex desire. For, and although it's not very pleasant to note, it is quite interesting to notice how in quite a lot of Victorian literature characters who are presented as exhibiting same-sex desire, which the Victorians would have considered to be something wrong with you internally, are also characters with disabilities, which the Victorians would have thought of as something wrong with you externally. Next I want to talk about Charles Dickens's Little Dorrit, another book very interesting in terms of same-sex attraction within Victorian books. The two characters I want to talk about in Little Dorrit are Miss Wade and Tatty Coram, also known as Harriet. Harriet, also known as Tatty Coram, was a foundling. She was brought up in the Coram Hospital and was adopted in a way by a family called the Meagles, who took her on partly as a companion to their daughter, but also in a way as a servant, and they don't treat her very well, and they're very patronising towards her, and she is persuaded by a woman called Miss Wade to run away with her. This plotline is very interesting in a number of ways, but I do think from a modern perspective, and even possibly from a perspective from the time, it's really, really hard to not see some kind of homoeroticism between Harriet and Miss Wade. And in many ways, the role that Miss Wade occupies in this plotline is that of the seducer. She takes 
takes on what is generally a male role within Victorian literature and she, a fairly unrespectable person who is not much liked, lures Harriet away from her respectable home and takes her away with her to live with her. Harriet was definitely oppressed by the Meagles but we're also given a sense in Little Dorrit that Harriet is both oppressed by and also attracted to and attached to Miss Wade. When the Meagles go to see Harriet to see if she'll come back, Miss Wade and Harriet appear hand in hand and continue to hold hands for the bulk of the scene. Miss Wade says to Mr Meagles, whether you find me temporarily and cheaply lodging in an empty London house or in a Calais apartment you find Harriet with me. The idea that they are now a pair and that they will continue to live together. As I said, Miss Wade takes on the typical Victorian role of the seducer here in taking Harriet away from the more respectable family she has been with and their relationship is presented almost as a kind of controlling romantic relationship. And I do think that the screenwriter Andrew Davis was rather right in saying that even if Dickens didn't intend Miss Wade to come across as lesbian that's quite hard from a modern perspective to read the relationship she and Harriet have in any other way. The next book I want to talk to you about and the final Dickens book on my list is Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens and in here I think we find a really interesting incidence of the kind of deferral of affection and transferal of affection that you see again and again in Victorian literature of a young man from their male best friend to the male best friend's sister. And I'm talking in this about Smike because I would argue that Smike is not really in love with Kate Nickleby and is in fact very much in love with Nicholas Nickleby. The devotion Smike shows towards Nicholas throughout the book and the deep attachment he has to Nicholas is, I would argue, something more than that of friendship and thankfulness and it is, I would argue, a deep emotional and romantic attachment. At one point Smike kneels to Nicholas Nickleby. Nicholas says, why do you kneel to me? To go with you anywhere, everywhere, to the world's end, to the churchyard grave. Let me, oh do let me, you are my home, my kind friend, take me with you, pray. And later, may I go with you, asked Mike timidly. I will be your faithful, hard-working servant, I will indeed. I want no clothes, these will do very well, I only want to be near you. The idea that Smike's main aim in life is now just to remain close to Nicholas. I do think that later on in the book when Smike sort of falls in love with Kate Nickleby, you can view this as a transfer of affection. His love for Nicholas, which will be considered taboo and inappropriate within Victorian society, is transferred into a love for Kate, who is as close as he can get to Nicholas in female form, and who has a very similar personality to Nicholas throughout the book. In fact, earlier on, before he ever meets Kate, he asks Nicholas about her. He says, is she like you? And Nicholas says, why, so they say, only a great deal handsomer. And Smike replies, she must be very beautiful. And again, as I spoke about with Phil Squad in Bleak House, Smike is a character with a disability. And again, we see this connection between same-sex desire and physical disability. The next book I want to mention is Lady Orderly's Secret by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is an enjoyable and engaging book. And one of the things I found most interesting in reading this book is the relationship between Robert Audley and George Talboys because as far as my reading of the book goes, Robert Audley is very much in love with George Talboys and I find it very hard to read the book any other way and for me it's one of the most interesting parts of this book. George Talboys disappears fairly near the beginning of the book, that is what the mystery centres on, and Robert Audley is kind of amazed at just how much he misses his friend and just how devastated he is by the loss of him, just how much it distresses him that he has not seen this man and just how much he constantly longs for him. And in this book we again see this instance of a kind of transfer of affection to a more appropriate person. Robert Audley encounters George Talboys' sister and of course falls in love with her. But again and again in his descriptions of George's sister he talks about just how beautiful she is and just how much she so resembles George Talboys. He keeps on remembering the beauty of her eyes which are so like the eyes of his lost friend. Robert looked at her with a tender compassion in his face. She was so like the friend whom he had loved and lost that it was impossible for him to think of her as a stranger, impossible to remember that they had met this morning for the first time. The very first time he sees her, the two things we find out about her is that he could see that she was young and that she resembled George Talboys. Whenever her beauty is mentioned, it is always mentioned alongside the fact that she looks remarkably like George Talboys. And again and again you get the impression that the reason why Robert finds this woman so attractive is because she so clearly resembles her brother, his best friend whom he loved. Lady the Orderly's Secret is an interesting novel but the main central plotline of it was not necessarily my favourite. The thing I really loved about Lady the Orderly's Secret and the reason why I found it such an interesting novel was the relationship between George and Robert and how interesting Robert's feelings for George are. 
Next I have a Hardy book I want to talk to you about and that is A Lysodian by Thomas Hardy. This is not my favourite Thomas Hardy novel but I think there is a really interesting relationship here between the two main female characters Paula and Charlotte. One of the first things we hear about their relationship together is uh, outsider commenting now that's a curious thing again, these girls being so fond of one another. They'd be more like lovers than maid and maid. They'd be more like lovers than maid and maid. I mean, surely Hardy knew what he was doing there. Surely, surely, surely. Now these two are quite interesting and another interesting pair I think to look at in terms of deferral of affection. I think it's very interesting to see the very strong relationship and friendship between Paula and Charlotte being one that is in a way romanticised because it partly explains Paula's indecision between her two male suitors throughout the book and quite how unable she is to define her feelings for either of them and it also explains a lot of incidences to do with deferral of affection that go on throughout the book. One of Paula's main love interests is Charlotte's brother and Charlotte is desperately keen for Paula to marry her brother in a way because for Paula to marry Charlotte's brother is the closest Charlotte could get to marrying Paula herself. Similarly over the course of the book Charlotte exhibits some signs of love for George Somerset who is another of Paula's suitors and this in a way I think you can also view as a kind of deferral of affection. It is not appropriate for her to be in love with Paula and therefore she does the next best thing and she tries to love someone who loves Paula. She tries to love where Paula loves. Obviously there are many ways to interpret the various relationships going on in Alisodium but for me to interpret them that way does a lot to explain Paula's character throughout the book. You never feel that close to her throughout the book, you never quite understand her motivations and the idea that perhaps actually where her love lies is neither with the two men in the book but actually with Charlotte, that for me is a much more compelling interpretation of the book and makes me like Paula and the book quite a bit more. The next book I want to quickly mention is the novella The Grey Lady by Elizabeth Gaskell. I don't have too much to say on this because I don't think it is very pronounced but I do think there is a certain amount of homoeroticism and at least kind of romanticising of attachment between Anna and her maid Amanth. They have this kind of romantic friendship and certainly Anna feels much more for this woman than she ever does for her husband and in part of the book indeed they end up living as husband and wife. Amanth dresses up as a man and pretends to be a man in order that she and Anna can live together and pretend to be different people and she takes on what are stereotypically masculine roles within her relationship with Anna. At one point Anna even refers to Amanette as my husband. The next book I want to talk about is Carmilla by J. Sheridan Le Fanu and this is a really really interesting one in terms of homoeroticism and same-sex desire within Victorian literature. This book is one of the first vampire novels and deals chiefly with the relationship between a mysterious young woman called Carmilla who suddenly turns up at a large desolate country house and Laura the young woman that lives there and their friendship is very very romanticised and incredibly sexualised throughout the book. There is a sense of physical closeness and attraction and also this sense with which Laura views Carmilla both with this deep attraction but also with a slight repulsion which again I think ties in with sort of same-sex attraction and the fact that it was considered a sin within the Victorian period. The fact that Laura is both incredibly attracted to Carmilla but also there is part of her which believes that that is wrong because of the time that she lives in and again because Carmilla is in some way supernatural we get this kind of othering of same-sex desire and homosexuality within Carmilla and a kind of necessary defeat of female homosexuality. And I'm just going to read you some quotes from Carmilla just to show quite how emphasised the relationship between Laura and Carmilla is and just quite how romanticised and sexualised it is. Carmilla was slender and wonderfully graceful except that her movements were languid, very languid and Indeed. There was nothing in her appearance to indicate an invalid. Her complexion was rich and brilliant, her features were small and beautifully formed, her eyes large, dark and lustrous, her hair was quite wonderful. I never saw hair so magnificently thick and long when it was down about her shoulders. I have often placed my hands under it and laughed with wonder at its weight. It was exquisitely fine and soft and in colour a rich dark brown with something of gold. I loved to let it down, tumbling with its own weight, as in her room she lay back in her chair, talking in her low sweet voice. I used to fold it and braid it and spread it out and play with it. Heaven, if I had but known all. She used to place her pretty arms about my neck, draw me to her, and laying her cheek to mine, murmur with her lips near my ear, Dearest, your little heart is wounded. Think me not cruel because I obey the irresistible law of my strength and weakness. If your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation, I live in your warm life, and you shall die, die, sweetly die into mine. You cannot help it. As I draw near to you, you in your turn must draw near to others and learn the rapture of that cruelty which yet is love. So for a while seek to know no more of me and mine, but trust me with all your loving spirit. 
and when she had spoken such rhapsody she would press me more closely in her trembling embrace and her lips in soft kisses gently glow upon my cheek. Sometimes after an hour of apathy my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and fold it with fond pressure, renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing into my face with languid and burning eyes and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with a tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardour of a lover, it embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering, and with gloating eyes she drew me to her, with, and her hot lips travelled across my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper, almost in sobs, You are mine, you are mine, you and I are one for ever. Then she had thrown herself back in her chair with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. The next book I want to talk to you about is Drama in Muslim by George Moore. When I first heard that this book had been banned from circulating libraries because of its lesbian content, I was rather more excited than perhaps it warranted. There is no reciprocal same-sex relationship within this book, but I think it is fair to say that the character of Cecilia is definitely, definitely in love with the character of Alice, and that I think that is almost certainly what George Moore was intending here, especially considering many of the other quite radical and shocking for the Victorian period things which are dealt with in this book. Cecilia and Alice go to an all-girls convent school together, and after they leave, Cecilia constantly longs for the all-female companionship of that convent, and regrets that Alice and her have now been brought into the world of men. She is bitterly jealous of anyone else that Alice speaks to, especially of men, and declares throughout this book her hatred of men, and that Alice can never understand her, and that Alice does not understand that her feelings for Alice are not quite what Alice's feelings are for her. And this again is another instance of a character with a disability also showing same-sex desire. Lover was never more anxious to meet mistress than this little deformed girl to see her friend. George Moore says that there was something of the passion of the lover in Cecilia's voice, and later when Alice is in Dublin, and Alice meets a man who she has some kind of flirtation with, Cecilia gets news of this at home and writes an incredibly passionate and incredibly jealous letter to Alice, claiming that if Alice marries this man, Cecilia will die. And the letter Cecilia writes is in many ways a love letter, and it is written like the letter of a betrayed lover whom is sickly jealous. Now will you promise to write and tell me if this be true? I had sooner know the worst at once, hear that you love him madly, passionately, as I believe some women love men. But you who are so nice, so good, so beautiful, you could not love a man thus. I cannot think you could. I will not think you do. I have been crying all the morning, crying bitterly, horribly. Horrible thoughts have forced themselves on my mind. I have seen, but it was not true, though it seemed so clear. Visions are not always true. This man kissing you. Oh, Alice, let me warn you, let me beg of you to think before you abandon yourself to a man's power, to a man's love. You will not marry him. Surely you will not. Oh, to be left here alone, never to see you again. I could not bear it. I should die. You will not leave me to die, Alice, dear. You will not. Write and tell me you will not. There are moments when I see you, yes, see you sitting by that man. I see you now, the scene is a long blue drawing room, all the glow with gold mirrors and wax candles. He is sitting by you and I see you smiling upon him. My blood boils, Alice. I fear I am going mad. My head drops on the table. I strive to shut out the odious sight, but I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. This is the letter of a girl who is driven to distraction by complete jealousy and by her love of Alice. Alice has to repeatedly tell Cecilia throughout this book that her talk is unrespectable and inappropriate and that it is not right for Cecilia to talk to her in the way that she does, and Alice is always at pains to pretend that Cecilia's deep devotion and passion for her must be the result of her illness. Cecilia, dear, listen, I'll forgive the language you have used towards me, for you do not know what you are saying. You must be ill, you could not be in your right senses today or you would not speak like that. Drama and Muslin is quite a radical book in many ways, and this, I think, is one of the most interesting parts of it. And I think it's also very interesting that this book was banned from the circulating libraries at the time, because it shows not only that this is how we would interpret this as a modern reader, but also that that was how the Victorians interpreted it too. The next book I want to talk about is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, which, like Drama and Muslin and Carmela, I think it's fair to say is one of the Victorian books that is definitely intentional in its homoeroticism. We have three men I want to particularly talk about here. There is Dorian himself, there is Basil, and there is also Henry. In the very first chapter of the book we are aware that Basil is deeply in love with Dorian. He says, Dorian Gray is my best and dearest friend. He has a simple and beautiful nature. Don't spoil him. Don't try to influence him. Your influence will be bad. The world is wide, 
and has marvellous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person who gives to my art whatever charm it possesses. My life as an artist depends upon him. He says that Dorian's beauty is such that art cannot express it, and is worried to show the world his portrait of Dorian Gray because he thinks he has put too much of his heart and soul into it, because he thinks that if someone looks on that painting they will realise his deep love and romantic attraction to Dorian. It is also important to look at Dorian himself and also the relationship between Henry and Dorian. In the very first chapter Basil describes Dorian as all the perfection of the spirit that is Greek, and Henry talks about the Hellenic ideal, and these references to the Greeks which come up again and again in Dorian Gray emphasise that kind of idealised Greek relationship that Oscar Wilde himself was interested in, a relationship which was considered both sexual and romantic and also to an extent kind of mentor-like between an older man and a younger man. In this way were sexual relationships between men accepted in ancient Greece, and this is the kind of dynamic you get I think between Henry and Dorian. The relationship between Henry and Dorian is that of a mentor and a mentee, but it's also very homoerotic. Henry aims to make Dorian feel for him what Basil feels for Dorian, to dominate Dorian and make Dorian reliant on and passionately attached to him. The whole book is full of a lot of homoeroticism. Later on in the book Basil confronts Dorian with a long list of young men who have been in a way ruined by Dorian. Young men who, by being associated with and having a close friendship with Dorian, have been driven to suicide or ruin or to leave the country. The suggestion being, of course, that it's because of Dorian's sexual and romantic relationships between them. Dorian Gray is quite an interesting figure within the Victorian literature because I think he is one of the few Victorian characters I can think of who is presented as being definitely bisexual. And in this book it is suggested that he has relationships with both women and with men. And also it's interesting that Basil, however, much he might be in love with Dorian is not really the kind of person that would ever act on it, and Henry, however much he may enjoy having Dorian come to rely on him and be attached to him, also wouldn't necessarily act on his same-sex desire, whereas Dorian has no such scruples and throughout the book acquires a very bad reputation for being everything that the Victorians consider immoral, including homosexual. So yes, if you're interested in looking for LGBT themes in Victorian literature, this is definitely one to read. <laughs> Finally, I do just want to mention one poem, and that is In Memoriam by Alfred Tennyson. This was a poem written by Alfred Tennyson over a long period of years, which is an elegy to his friend Arthur Henry Hallam, who died when he was young. It is an elegy for this lost man, but it's also in a way a deep love letter, and it is written with a great longing for physical closeness to the dead man. An earlier review in the time complained that surely this is a strange mode of address to a man Man, even though he might be dead, suggesting that there is something inappropriate or considered taboo about the way that Tennyson addressed Arthur Henry Hallam in this poem. I do think there is a lot of kind of homoeroticism in this poem, and Holly Fernie, who I spoke about earlier, who wrote Queer Dickens, has written an interesting essay on this, which I will try and link down below as well. It's complicated further by the fact that Tennyson at times talks in the voice of Hallam's widow, and so it's difficult, therefore, to draw the line between him taking on the feelings of the woman who was married to Hallam and also his own romanticised feelings towards Hallam. But this is in fact the poem where the very famous lines, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all' came from, and they're not talking about a relationship between a man and woman, they're talking about Tennyson's relationship with his best male friend, which is within the world of this poem, one that is, I think, romanticised. And again, I will link Holly Fernie's essay down below on this, because it is a really interesting one. So I think that is all I have to say in terms of same-sex love and desire within the Victorian literature. I'm sorry this has been quite a long video, I had quite a lot to say, but hopefully if you're interested in these themes you will find that some of these books will interest you. These 11 pieces of literature are really well worth a read, especially The Picture of Dorian Gray and Carmilla and Drama and Muslin, and also Lady Orderly Secret. Those four are the ones where I think it is the most major part of the plot and major part of the story. The Dickens I think is really really interesting but tend to be under the surface and smaller parts of the book, but nonetheless worth a look at and really really fascinating. Please let me know down in the comments below if you have any other recommendations or thoughts or theories on other Victorian literature where there is same-sex attraction between two different characters because as I said this is something I'm really really interested in in Victorian literature. Please let me know down below in the comments what your thoughts are on what I've said in this video and if you have any other suggestions for other books that might have similar themes. Thank you very much for watching, I'm sorry it was long, I had a lot to say, and I'll be back very soon with another Victober video.